Thanks for joining us, Yana, and please tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work before we get started. Take it away. Well, thank you, Justin. It's a real pleasure to be with you all. It's always fun to be at the, at the local scale and, and talking to people in my community. Um, I know many of your names, but not all of your names. So if you wouldn't mind dropping a little note in the chat, that always helps me make sure I scale what I talk about to who you are all, who you all are. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I grew up in Southern Humboldt in Harris. Uh, I'm a, from a homesteading family, just like many of you all. Um, and perhaps that's what's given me the pension and interest in the built environment and how we actually build resilience into our communities, into our neighborhoods, into our homes. Um, you know, we're in a really difficult and awkward period of transition in, in this new kind of fire frame that we're in. And so I'm really passionate about, you know, empowering people and bringing, you know, very uh, evidence-based information so that we can all make um, choices in how we design, build, and retrofit our communities. Um, I'll share that uh, Christina Huff and I go back a, a, quite a bit. And, you know, um, my father started a wildfire with a uh, weed racker with a metal blade when I was about 10. Um, and then there was another fire that was started by some kids who were playing with matches when I was about 12. Um, I lived in Oakland during the Oakland Hills uh, fire in 1990. Um, my life has been shaped and formed by wildfire incidences. Um, in those early cases, we didn't lose any homes. In the later cases, it turned into be a rather um, you know, spectacular event that people didn't think was possible. Um, in my current job, I am in partnership with the County of Humboldt and the County of Del Norte. Uh, and in that role, I work to uh, help people work through difficult issues, bringing science and the best available information. Uh, I'm a trained a registered professional forester, uh, but I picked up skills from some of my colleagues over the years uh, in the space of um, looking at buildings and their performance and the interaction between the landscaping, the forest conditions, the wildland conditions, and how those interplay with the structures that we find so important. And so uh, tonight I've got a, a presentation that is going to try and strike some of that. And you know, I'm going to I'm going to talk start at the kind of high level and think about and try and put some provocative thoughts together about sort of our evolution as a society in fire mitigation strategies. And then I'm going to do some more teaching and talk about fire exposures and um, share some recent experiences I've had with um, some incidences that you may have heard about. And then I'm going to start to drill down into these terms we've called defensible space and, you know, home hardening and, and ultimately get to the place where we can talk about action and resources and what you can do. I've got, I don't know, 40 minutes or so of that. Um, I don't want this to be flat and boring. I really like us to all, um, you know, be communicative, and I wish we were in person. So I'll do my best. I'm now managing three screens, so that should boggle my brain. But um, nonetheless, I just want you to know if I can leave you with any message, and that is that there are proactive and positive things that people can do that will greatly benefit themselves, their families, and their communities. And um, I, I want to express that there's tons of reason for hope. Um, even in the face of the kinds of events that you know, the media has really um, defined as life altering and game changers and oppressive related to climate change and things that we cannot do, cannot solve easily. And I just really want to say that collectively and together we can do so much. So you hear a lot about this term fire resiliency and what does that mean? So you know, resiliency is about uh, being able to return to, uh, to a state or condition before some uh, disturbance agent. Uh, in this case, we'll use you know, fire as the example, but you know, how do we fix it? What does it mean to fix this fire issue? And, and I just really also wanna say what an honor it is to, to be on the stage with uh, Jeff Kane and with Will Harling, um, some dear colleagues, and I think we all operate in this space and, and have um, great respect and uh, like how we can you know, find the different parts that we can all work in. 
And that's exactly what this slide is about. It's about how do we get to a better condition, a better place where um, when wildfire occurs, it's not so disturbing, that it's actually beneficial for the environment and doesn't knock us off our, our trajectory. And to do that, we really have to break down the silos. We really have to figure out how to turn all the dials. There's no silver bullet. It's a multi-pronged strategy that's gonna take a while for us to get there. So here's you know, my effort in the landscape to try and lay out where the options and the opportunities are, right? So you know, we heard from probably Jeff and Will about the space around wildland management, but there's so much opportunity to better steward our forests and our landscapes. And there's some barriers and there's some challenges and there's some tools to make that work. Um, and then today I'm gonna to talk about you know, the resilient home or the resilient built environment and looking at you know, construction and landscape and defensible space and how those synergistically work to, with each other. But resiliency is more than that. It's also thinking about land use planning and zoning. It's thinking about our infrastructure and how do we protect both the physical infrastructure and then the community infrastructure that we hold so dear. And then looking at sort of what is the value and role of open space and agriculture for buffers and safe zones and you know, are our open spaces in those conditions now? How do we think about those uh, in a more uh, geographically dispersed way? Um, you know, where is the opportunity? But then we can't forget about you know, the early warning systems through weather forecasting and alerts and how do we get better about that? Um, how do we you know, make those um, be more effective for us? How do you do that in a really rural environment where you may or may not have cell coverage, where you may or may not have power, all those things? You know, how do we work as teams? And you know, I don't know if any of you all are in the uh, volunteer fire department realm, but you know, thinking about mutual aid and how we strategically work together across our agencies and systems, it's complex. And um, I mean, we've got a lot of good effort that's happened in this space, but there's always more room for opportunity. And then you know, when and, and after a disturbance, how do we rebuild in a way that's um, using the best available information so that we can rebuild our communities, our organizations, and support all of our people? So in my mind, this is about something where we need to turn all the dials and we all need to work together and we need to figure out where those institutional barriers are and where we can um, create synergies and work together. So I know that's kind of a, a heavy way to start this talk, um, but I think it really, to me, helps frame um, the issues because uh, the wildfire issue has been really relegated to the forest and it's all been about what the forest can do and and what the forest needs to how the forest needs to change and when you look at sort of the materials that we've been putting out for the last couple of decades right defensible space has been the solution and you know the, really the guidance has been about creating a defendable space under the assumption that your friends and neighbors who are either VFD volunteer fire department members or work for whatever agency that is responsive to you, in this case would be CAL FIRE, have a safe place to be able to stage so that they can manage an oncoming fire so that it moves out of the crown of the trees into something that is um, spreading at a rate that you can put crews on, that the flame heights are not too much, that there's too much risk and exposure. And that all works when you've got average fire conditions. Um, but if you look at all of our graphics, they've been about the forest, um, but we know it's more complicated than that. And so the question I put before you is sort of what type of fire should we be preparing for? I'm gonna give some terms today that may be new to you, may not be new to you, but there's terms like average fire conditions, extreme fire conditions, there's also different types of fire exposures. There's something called direct flame contact, ember exposure, and radiant heat. And I'll define each of those in a minute. I think many of us uh, were captivated in the same ways when we you know, heard the stories of what was um, unfolding in the campfire in paradise. Um, and you know, and here's just an image of sort of the insidious nature of wind distributed are called firebrands or burning um, distributions of uh, vegetation or elements coming from our, our built structures. So, you know, these materials can find the smallest and weakest parts of our buildings. And so how does that fit with our previous messages? 
Well, it kind of doesn't because our previous messages have all been about how to manage the vegetation so that that type of event won't happen because the assumption is that a crew um, of first responders is going to be there. But when you look at, you know, here's the Angora fire and the vegetation wasn't involved at all. And in fact, it looks more like, um, you know, a spaceship came down and zapped this building. Um, but when you detangle it and understand what happened, it's likely that that wind distribution of embers was able to find a weak point in the building and either penetrate it or create a spot fire on or adjacent to it. So how do we prepare for something that in some respects we can't even see? And so that's, you know, where from a, an intellectual space, you know, I think we need to think differently about bioprotection and um, being prepared. And so, you know, Ember defense has a different look about it, right? Because embers can travel long distance. We know they can travel, um, depending on their size, really as much as a mile or more. Um, and I admitted someone to the waiting room, from the waiting room. Very good. Sorry, just need to pull it together. But when we're thinking about something that has a long distance distribution, that has long capacity travel, it changes how we think about our typical and, and more well understood concept around defensible space. And so today, what I'm gonna talk about is thinking a little differently. Um, and this concept applies to whether you're in an urban environment, a suburban environment, a very rural environment, or you know, in Southern Humboldt, which has got a lot of amazing parts, but it is, also has its own challenges. So coming back to those terms, direct flame contact, I just want to describe some vocabulary. So the point here is that everyone needs to be prepared for all three types of fire exposures. And our previous strategies around education of fire was really aimed specifically at this direct flame contact piece where you have fire burning from somewhere farther away from your structure towards your building. And the goal is to modify the vegetation so that you can put crews or that it will go out and not attach, not directly contact with the building. So I think we understand what that's about. This ember piece in the middle panel is a little more complicated, right? Because there's this long distance component of it. And then it suddenly requires us to think about what is combustible near and adjacent to our buildings, on our buildings, and what is permeable on our buildings, such as the vents as shown here, or the weaknesses that gutters present and such. So thinking about direct flame contact with embers requires different strategies, as does being aware of what we call radiant heat. And radiant heat, I, I best think about it as um, you know, it's a rainy day, you were out in the woods, your shoes are wet, you put them by the wood stove, and if you put them a little too close, you might get ignition. The concept that you don't actually have physical contact, but there's the transmission of heat through the air currents that can get uh, the adjacent material um, sufficiently dried and heated to the point that you can either have failure in that product or um, combustion. So when you have a woodshed, an outbuilding of some kind, um, and that is ignited, and if it's adjacent to a single pane window, for example, uh, or some other uh, finer element, you can create failure, like in this window, or you could actually create ignition. So thinking about what's adjacent to our buildings um, is equally important as the ember and direct line contact piece. Does that make sense? Um, I'm just gonna assume it does, but this is how this movement towards home hardening and defensible space is switching because we're starting to think about the structure itself, what's around the structure and how do we mitigate all those pathways for fire exposure. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the data that drives uh, what I do. I'm going to nerd out a little bit. I am still a scientist. Um, and I've uh, had the pleasure of doing some uh, more involved investigations. So one here represented is from Paradise and the Campfire. And what I really want to show is that when you look at uh, the campfire, which was in a oak woodland and um, ponderosa pine forest, you can see there's a lot of green. And where the green isn't is where, it's, is where the trees are farther away from the structures. Radiant heat was one of the biggest contributors to the damage and loss of buildings in paradise. And we, uh, myself and my colleagues did some investigation into better understand these issues. 
And just to say of the damaged homes where we didn't have full loss, 63% was related to radiant heat. So once you get ignition in one building, this adjacency piece becomes a significant issue. And that adjacency can cause damage on the windows as well as the exterior walls, um, just for illustration. If, you, if this was a wildland fire where all the vegetation was engaged, you wouldn't see any of this green necessarily left. So uh, the condition of the vegetation gives you some clues to what was happening. Now, what we learned when we looked in at Paradise, which not all of it looks like this um, Frank Lloyd Wright sort of uh, typical suburban community, but really 73% of homes were less than 18 meters, that's 54 feet of a destroyed structure. The distance to the nearest destroyed structure was the strongest predictor and failure of any of the variables available. So this community effect has a lot of bearing. Now, you all might think, well, I live in a rural area. I, I you know my property, I've got 40 acres, you know, and it's a long way away from my neighbor. But what I want to bring forward is this idea of what surrounds your primary home? Is it a garage? Is it a shed? Is it an outhouse? Is it a woodshed? You know, what are the structures that are within your near curtilage zone? And what are the conditions that they're in? Because their survival affects your, your primary building survival pieces considerably. So just to show some fun stats, because I'm still a nerd, um, we did a lot of analysis and, and used something called decision tree analysis to try and understand better what, um, what predicts survival. Um, and what we saw was that, I'm gonna turn us down here, is that these are just basically big splits. The computer did uh, a look, a mathematical analysis as to what the relationships were. 73% of the surviving homes were uh, greater than 18 meters away, so greater than 50 feet away, they had less canopy cover, um, and they were built in the more newer time frames. There were very few homes that met those conditions, and so what we see is that radiant heat is driving a big part of the relationship. Near building combustibles and the contributions of leaf litter and other um, elements associated with being under a forested canopy had an effect. Um, and then the era of construction had an effect. So I'm gonna, these are sort of teaser ideas, but I, I want you to understand what is driving the, the framework for the talk that I'm gonna get into. I also, um, two weeks ago, had the opportunity to go to the Marshall Fire in Boulder, Colorado. And I don't know how many of you paid attention to that. That was a fire that started on December 30th of this year. Um, and it was under really extreme wind events. Uh, it burned a thousand structures and, you know, I think challenged a lot of us to think about, well, what happens when you have wildfire in late December and what is that about? And is it climate change or, you know, what, what might it be? Uh, I went with colleagues from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, as well as some colleagues from the university. And, you know, here's the context. It's a grassland condition on the, on the foothills on the Eastern side of the Rockies. And what we saw was not a total surprise. Um, so I'm gonna just sort of dig into some of the construction products and this might start to make some sense um, as I lay this out. So here is uh, a brand new condo development built in I think 2000. Um, there are lost homes on this uphill side. The um, wildfire suppression community decided that they were gonna take a stand right here at this walkway. Um, and uh, they were working tirelessly at it. And basically what saved them, saved these buildings here was that the wind died down at about eight o'clock at night. Uh, and that's when things changed. But when you look at the surrounding buildings and that's what these two pictures illustrate, you can see where their vulnerable points were given the amount of extreme radiant heat that was coming off these burning structures. Um, so I'm gonna talk about glass for a minute. And, um, we all know that um, glass has difficult breaking patterns and can be hazardous to us. And so there's something called annealed glass and tempered glass. So annealed glass breaks in shards and it's kind of dangerous. Tempered glass has a different, more um, granulated breaking pattern. Um, so we, tempered glass is a little more expensive. We put tempered glass in windows where we, like sliding glass doors, where we might come in out of it. So code in Colorado specified tempered glass in the sliding glass windows. It did not specify it in these kind of light, you know, these light reflecting windows into the upper, into the upper element. So what we saw from that radiant heat exposure is that the annealed glass all failed 
but the tempered glass did not. Um, here's another illustration of that annealed glass failing in this situation, and you can see the damage on the, um, the vinyl blinds that sit behind this. So my point is that product matters um, and thinking about radiant heat is important. Um, the heat resistance quality of tempered glass is significantly greater than annealed glass. So it's not just one single product, but it's understanding what your exposures might be. So interesting stuff there. Um, here's another example. This is a neighborhood that was built in the early 90s. They have um, these sort of stucco constructed walls on top of uh, wood, uh, a wood frame. And um, there's a golf course on the outside here. Just an interesting pathway. So basically, the wind was blowing this direction. We had wildfire ignition on the golf course. It was quite dry. We had a backing fire that came up to the base of this, this wall. Um, there's wood members uh, sticking out. And there was a, a fence that basically caught the bottom end here. There was enough material for the embers and the direct flame contact to ignite caught leaves and such. There was a fence that came all the way across and attached to this house right here, also shown in this direction. What we suspect happened is that that um, vegetation fire ignited the, the caught material at the base, which ignited the fence. The fence carried the fire along with some um, board that was designed to separate the properties as well as some um, vegetation borders. And that brought flame directly to the edge of the stucco constructed building. Um, but we had wood combustible material in the under eave area and the fascia. And then we had fire penetration basically into the attic as a result of that. Looking at it from another direction, coming um, this direction right here. Now, why we see these retaining walls here is because there ultimately was firefighter suppression that prevented the whole building from igniting and protected this building here. So this is the kind of environment where we're learning about um, what actually happens. Um, I happen to work with colleagues that have a lab uh, where they can construct buildings and um, test them in a more controlled environment with wind. Um, and different fire exposures to be able to confirm these concepts. But this, my point being, is that there are small and detail, uh, small details that are worth paying attention to and thinking about pathways and conductance of a wildland fire to directly to the house. All right, hope everybody's doing well here. Um, I'll close on the idea of the, this Marshall fire and say, Here's a garden bed with rock mulch on the outside. Again, stucco wall construction. Um, we're very confident that embers ignited this slightly woody um, plant here. We had ignition and that put pressure immediately on this vent. Um, it did not create ignition on the other side of it. We took the vent off, um, but just to show what the connection is, even though you think you might have this very durable wall, there is a relationship between what's combustible on the outside of that and what pressure might be put on the wall itself. Here's a decorative ornamental conifer. I have one of these, I need to look up what its name is. It also ignited from embers, not from a fire at the surface. And we had enough ignition to uh, put pressure on this under eave area and the soffit area. Um, so this house likely had multiple points of ignition. So these are the kind of post-fire um, studies we use to, to drive what I'm talking about. So switching back to where our defensible space messages have been, um, this picture was used in uh, 2006 as meeting you know, the best available thought. You know, we had well-mowed grass, uh, we had branches and trees that were limbed, um, you know, it looked like you could easily put an engine there and safely defend it. Um, the challenge when you now put your lens on about, oh, what if you have this long distance ember transport? What does that mean? Well, look at this. We have very dense woody vegetation that basically surrounds this building. Even though you have irrigation, it's unclear what's happening directly near to those windows. So the potential for spot fires being um, ignited adjacent to this building is sort of the new risk and the new thinking. So, you know, even when you look at the CAL FIRE guidance, which is going to be changing, you'll be sort of um, 
confirmed as a society that it's okay to sort of anchor your home in this type of vegetation. I'm beginning to feel very differently about that. Um, and so what you're gonna see coming in uh, policy changes is this idea of three zones um, and really making a lot of attention to what's immediately adjacent to the building. So there's an, in, in the defensible space code, you'll see zone one and zone two. Well, now there's gonna be a new zone called zone three, which is the first five feet around the building in any attached deck or stairwell. Um, really trying to dial in, well, what happens when you get ignition and material that's right adjacent to that? It's, if you don't have someone there to defend it, it's very difficult to retain that building. So really trying to draw public attention to the vulnerability that is around and adjacent to the buildings. Um, not a lot of changes coming in this, you know, this the next 30 and 100 feet, but this idea of creating um, discontinuity or islanding your vegetation so that there are not easy pathways for, for a wildland fire to burn directly to the building. And then adding this non-combustible zone, this, this zero to five feet around all of our structures. That's where we're going uh, in terms of thinking about how to protect the buildings from, from embers themselves. Um, and then, you know, not all of us live in paradise with 40 acres. Many of us live in town uh, and we live where there's you know, close connection between buildings and between communities. And so, you know, trying to think about that when we share that defensible space zone. Um, what we saw in Colorado and I guess they didn't chose to was that fences were incredibly efficient at bringing wildland fire to the building. So replacing fences uh, with a gate at that point of connection is highly significant and we think will really make a big difference. I'll share some more about that in a bit. Uh, in policy, you won't see a lot of um, guidance changing about fire and steep slopes, but the point being, just if you're not familiar with it, is that uh, fire burns uphill fairly easily, and what you tend to get is a preheating effect as you have wildland fire down below your structure. It begins to dry out the vegetation as the fire moves uphill. It can also dry out the condition of the buildings, and so we want to interrupt that fire pathway if you happen to have a great piece of paradise with a wonderful view, you know, this deck is particularly vulnerable. So um, thinking about the separation and clearance can make a difference there. Um, and we can go into those spacing guiding lines if you'd like in more detail in a bit. Um, I'm gonna take a pause here for a second. I know I'm, I'm hitting you with a lot, but paradigm shifting takes work and takes some time to think through this. Um, I think all of us want uh, easy answers and we want to know that um, that this is the right thing to eat or this is the right thing to plant or this will be healthy for us or this will be safe for us. And so there are efforts to try and label plants um, to say that this is a fire smart landscape or this is a fire wise plant choice. Um, and I'm going to challenge you for a minute and say it's really difficult to do. Um, and if you really want to dig into it, evaluating plant flamm flammability is highly complicated, um, in part because all of us are different. I know Cheryl's on this call, and she's probably a terrific uh, person for taking care of plants. And I might be good for some of the months of the year, but not good for other months of the year. Uh, and so the plant condition changes. And so, I mean, just thinking about manzanita, which is a native um, shrub, right? its condition changes through time. It sheds its branches and, be, and it collects its dead and senesced leaves. And so it accumulates dead material. So there's, there's change in, in that plant condition. Um, think about lavender. I mean, we start, we start and we plant lavender. It's very lush when we, and very supple when we put it in the ground. And then if I don't water it or it's the next season, it can get woody and brittle and start to accumulate dead material. So when do you evaluate the plant condition? When you, the point of sale or the point of how I manage it, right? These are difficult things to do. Um, all plants are inherently combustible regardless of how they're marketed. And so in our shop, what we talk about is where you place them being more important and then how you maintain them being equally important. Um, yes, they're amazing native and drought tolerant species, but they, they can you know, burn just as easily as anything else. So uh, 
you know, the right plant in the right place is really what we're trying to promote and really thinking about the place uh, more than any other element. So I'm going to start to get into the home and, you know, what is, um, where are the weaknesses in the home? And here's just some examples. Some of these are taken from that lab I mentioned where you can see, um, you know, here's a wall and a roof. And um, this is a, pla a place where you can get uh, accumulation of leaf material. And so we ask the wall to behave as well as the roof. The roof is designed to resist fire explosion. The wall is not. Um, you can also have a rain gutter to roof edge. Uh, it's easy for a rain gutter to trap, catch and trap debris. You can get ember ignition in that, and you can also get fire to bypass the protective qualities of the roof based on fire in the gutter. Uh, vents, so this is taken from inside a building. This is a gable in vent. These are under eave vents. When you're blasting those embers at a building, uh, the porous nature of vents, because that's what you want. You want inflow to let warm and let cool air in. You want outflow to let hot, moist air out. Um, they're two way. Um, you can get penetration of embers and they can find uh, combustible material on the inside of the building. We talked a little earlier about fence to house connections. You can see it's easy to ignite a fence in a wildland fire situation and it can carry or bring or wick the fire to the building itself. Disrupting that pathway is what we're after. So um, I'm sure many of you know Kathy Weber. She worked with Sabelle and Julia and I at the Fire State Council. There's a brochure. If you haven't seen, um, it's available where we start to talk about where those priority locations are and how to think about these issues. So I've got uh, references at the end to, to draw your attention to. So how do you prioritize in this space? Um, Really, the highest priority is the roof, because the roof is the largest horizontal surface on your building. It is what is, gets the most exposure, both from radiant heat as well as embers, and then the edge. The vents, because they're porous, and then uh, the vegetation in the defensible space right near to the building. And that's really all about thinking about embers. But where your buildings are close to each other, it doesn't have to be in a residential setting. Really, you know, as I mentioned, it can be your outhouse, your woodshed, your storage shed, in your garage, when you've got less than 30 feet between buildings, then there are other elements on the structure itself that uh, may be subject to radiant heat. And we need to think about how we can shore that up or if you have the opportunity to push those buildings back um, so that you can manage that radiant heat issue. Roof number one priority, you know, just some more images about where those weak points are and what those transitions are. There's opportunities to retrofit and put a one hour fire rating on this um, intersection between these two roof planes, as is in this gable bank here. Um, there are gaps, there are holes in roofs, um, and here in tile roofs are particularly prone to them. You know, a regular inspection of all of those gaps is important. Uh, we talked about gutters earlier, um, just to say uh, gutter guards are important, especially non-combustible ones. Um, I don't have a product that I can really recommend. I've got some that are thinking about, but keeping those gutters clean are, is important. Um, I've seen lots of examples about how, how structures have almost been lost. Embers, you know, embers penetrate. And so where are we at now? Well, uh, the most common um, foundation vent, uh, gable and vent, has quarter inch mesh screening. We want something finer uh, to prevent uh, the ember penetration. Um, and there actually are a whole new product and class of, of vents that are designed specifically to resist both heat as well as uh, embers. And um, they have sort of different systems and different trade offs. Uh, but there's new listings of materials that meet uh, these criteria. I'm not aware of any, any um, building supply company in Humboldt County that provides these, um, but we can talk about where you might look for them and what, you, what the options might be from through fence to gable and vents to foundation vents. Um, I'm pretty jazzed about this stuff. It's also possible to tack up eighth inch mesh screen on your existing vents and, and give yourself a low cost but additional benefit for what you already have. And that can be added uh, on the outside or the inside, whichever is easier. Eaves, as you can imagine, are places where you get air circulation. You can also get sort of the eddy uh, creation, the circulation of, of uh, 
of fire and embers. And so these exposed rafters are more vulnerable than a softened or boxed in eave um, because you can get that circulation happening. What we really want to see is folks have something that is not combustible underneath those eaves. That's why we talk about five feet. Windows, as I mentioned earlier, um, tempered glass is far superior. Look, you can get um, 330, oops, we can get 335C resistance versus 112C for annealed. Um, in a high fire risk environment, I would go to both panes tempered. Um, you know, it depends on your situation. They are more expensive. I will acknowledge that. Here's car fire redding, potted plant created crack it, crack in the first window pane. We didn't have full failure. So, I mean, that's the good news. But just to illustrate that this is probably a annealed glass on the outside, tempered potentially on the inside. Um, this window needs to replace, be replaced, but the house wasn't lost. So that's, that's a good message. Decks. There's a lot to say about decks. There's great deck guidance about decks. And uh, maybe I'll take those in questions if people have them. There's some new ways to build decks, low cost that make a difference. But uh, if you get ignition in the deck, it's very easy to carry fire to the house. So thinking about how you might um, improve your condition is something worth considering. Um, and there's some retrofit strategies where you maybe replace these lax uh, deck boards and put a non-combustible attachment there a grate, for example. Um, and then there's some other ways and there's some links to these guides about what you can do if you're, if you're building a new deck. What you store under your deck is just as important. Um, you know, think about how much stuff could get trapped with embers in there or you could have direct flame contact. Um, I know it's out of sight, out of mind, but it's, it's, it's a real issue. Uh, fences, you know, they're finer, smaller material. It's more like kindling. It's very easy to ignite. A lot of structure from a, veg, uh, a grassland fire. Um, so what we're suggesting is you can still have a fence, but this attachment point really does matter. Now, siding is kind of on the lower list of priority if you can manage that radiant heat exposure. Um, but you know, a lot of folks say, well, I have, I have stucco construction or I have you know, this totally non-combustible box. I don't have anything to worry about. Well, my point here is that um, we don't live in caves for a reason. Um, we like to have windows, we like to have ventilation, and those become the vulnerable locations, the vulnerable elements of the building. Um, so cladding or your siding does matter um, if you can, however, if you can manage the direct flame contact potential uh, or the radiant heat potential, it becomes far less important as the other elements like the vents and the windows are. Here's just some examples of some burn experiments and you can see the lap siding can be penetrated and that gets into the stud wall when you've got ignition on the outside. Um, so you can, you can still have this with a non-combustible board like a, um, a fiber cement board. You can still get that warping and distortion and get into the cavity of the wall um, because of those joints. This is a teaser talk just to explain there are, there are elements in, in the home itself. There are things to be thinking about. Um, and you know when you've got combustible material right adjacent to the base of the siding, uh, that creates a, an incredible vulnerability. So you know, we're also having people think about the vertical separation as well as the horizontal separation uh, around the building. Oops, I'm almost done. Um, you know, and then there are some other vulnerable locations, right? What we leave outside, I have a, I have a cabin um, in the summer. I take my broom inside. I take my doormat inside. Um, I look at places like my underdoor area. Uh, I, during the August fire, I came back to my cabin from Harris and I opened the front door and underneath the front door to about four feet was just all ash. I'd never thought about how much air exchange was underneath that door and how easy it was to uh, allow um, embers to pass through. In this case, I had cold embers, I had ash, so I'm really lucky. Um, but you know, where you get dirt collecting in your building, that's probably gives you some indication that you've got some permeability. What about pet doors and open windows and all those things, right? When it's time for evacuation, all of those points need to be sealed. Um, solar panels, have some vulnerability, but it's more about the material that's collected underneath and you know, trying to manage that um, as best as you can. 
So as I conclude here, I just want to say that, um, in my opinion, you know, I started by saying that we're sort of in an awkward period of adjustment. And I, I think the building loss issue is pretty predictable. Um, we have to make some changes, but I do think we have some much clearer evidence-based information to give us um, choices and options and strategies. And I'm really quite optimistic about how we can put that adaptation into our built environment and figure out how to live in California. I'm not afraid to live in California. I just want to use the best available products with the best insulation and maintain it well so that you know my home is good for my kids and our future generations to the best of our abilities. When you think about this issue though, we really, you know, related to other natural disasters, you know, we don't fight earthquakes or tornadoes or hurricanes. We don't have a fighting force for that. We don't have a, you know, an earthquake fighting force uh, like we do in a wildland fire fire situation. What do we do with those disturbance agents? You know, we adapt and we build smarter. Um, we built California and the condition we see it with the expectation that there's either a volunteer or professional fire force to be able to save us. Um, and they work darn hard, um, but sometimes the system gets overloaded. So what can we do to help them? And in conclusion, you know, the majority of homes are guided from embers, um, and we need to help people understand that. We need to create, you know, unified messaging and alignment about what real risks are and how we can address them. Um, you're going to see changes in construction codes for new homes. Um, but the challenge is, you know, how do we incentivize upgrades to our existing structures to manage the ember and radiant heat issues? And um, you'll see coming soon basically mandates around this uh, zone zero or the first five feet around the building. Um, and it's, you know, really meant to try and protect people at homes. It's not meant to take away beauty or, or cause problems in any way. It's really meant in this and this best foot forward about applying available science and, and experience to thinking about what resiliency looks like. Um, I know these are not necessarily Humboldt County images, but this idea of shifting our planting to something a little farther away from the structure. We're not saying no planting, we're just saying push it off from the building a little bit. Create path, you know, create discontinuity, separate so that you don't get pathways for fire to travel to the house. And um, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna wrap up uh, with this uh, graphic from our uh, work with Kathy. Uh, this would be the 12 step point. I think it was advertised in the expression of, of this program. Um, and you know, these are available, they're free. We can download them. We can send you printed copies of them. Sort of look in and dial in about each of the places in our buildings. Um, and I will say there's no one product, really it's about the product itself, the construction, the assembly and the maintenance, all those have to work together uh, to really achieve uh, the greatest protection uh, benefits possible. So with that, I think I will conclude. I do have, uh, I'm sure you'll make these slides available. I do have a couple of uh, questions like what will we do in these particular situations, but um, I also have a set of resources for more information, uh, including uh, the Humboldt County piece, which is where those uh, new brochures are written for a specific rural environment. Um, and with that, uh, I think I'll stop. See if I bored you to death or brought you some ideas of value. All right, thank you so much, Jana. That was great. And uh, we're moving into the Q&A portion of the evening. So anybody who has questions, you can feel free to put that in the chat. I'm also gonna change the security features now to allow people to start their video and unmute themselves. So if people would rather ask questions with their video on and uh, their own voice, please do so. Um, in the meantime, I guess one question I had Yana was about, uh, for those of us with older homes, obviously there's a lot of retrofitting that needs to happen. And I wondered, um, do you have a sense of what an average cost might be for somebody looking to retrofit the wide suite of things that need to be done on these homes? It's a difficult question to answer because it's hard to know what the starting condition is. Um, the cabin I grew up in, no, no hope. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but 
Uh, there's been a, a recent study from the Headwaters Institute that looked at sort of the challenge, the, the, these kinds of changes uh, and adding a cost to new construction um, at 3% of the total new building cost. Um, here's what I'd say, you know, depending on the condition of your body, a lot of this can be done with just your own sweat equity and really thinking about what's adjacent to my building um, and is that something that I'm comfortable with? And um, this is a little bit of a controversial uh, statement, but you know, thinking about stick matches uh, and igniting a stick match and throwing it right next to my house. If I felt comfortable that that wasn't gonna cause problems, then maybe I'm in a okay condition. Um, but if that sort of creates the hair on the back of your neck and the panic of like, oh my God, what would happen if there was fire right there? Well, then there's some things to do. Um, you know, really it's, it's about taking a, a step back. We don't have to do it all in one year. I mean, what about going and getting some of the eighth inch mesh roll screen, uh, a staple gun um, and, you know, improving the condition of the vents, moving some of that vegetation off the building, um, putting in some gutter guards to keep the material out of the gutters if you have rain gutters. I mean, all of that is not super expensive. So um, I think we can all work together in this space. And I think you know, communities can band together and we all have different talents. Maybe some of us are better on ladders. Maybe some of us are better with a weed whacker. Um, you know, maybe some of us are better in the construction space. Um, but you know, working uh, together, I think, is, is quite possible. And, and thank you. While we wait for any more questions, are there are you seeing communities get together and do this on the group scale where uh, you've got a neighborhood or obviously in these rural communities, there's a lot of talk these days about um, things that need to happen in regards to fire resiliency. But I'm wondering on the home front, if uh, you're seeing much community engagement of people getting together and neighbors helping neighbors, that kind of thing. Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I, what I'm amazed is the vocabulary is changing um, and the awareness, the terminology awareness is changing. Um, I think, you know, these acute versus chronic issues, right? Uh, the acute issues is wildfire coming to me today. The chronic issue is I know wildfire could come. Um, I think a lot of us wait till the, the wildfire is on its way and then panic. Um, and then try and do this all in the last minute. I think it's hard to feel motivated, but the winter is a great time to do a lot of this stuff um, when the threat is not there. Uh, I'd like families to be thinking about when we gather for the holidays, you know, moms and dads and kids at various different ability levels can, can you know, what happens if you go spend a half a day working on the place? What do you achieve, right? These are, these are doable things. Um, the vent piece, I mean, that could be done depending on your house in a couple hours, right? It, it, it just really depends on the scale of the building. Where you've got adjacent buildings, those get a little more complicated. And um, we talk about deployable metal shutters as a temporary strategy. Um, we talk about other ways to try and um, make some protection benefits. Uh, in the evacuation space, you know, what do you do? What, you know, what, what's possible for the things you haven't fixed? Um, you know, those are difficult choices. Um, how to manage your water in that moment and um, you know, make sure you reserve some for your, your fire, uh, wildland firefighter team to come in. But, you know, it, we didn't build this landscape overnight and it's gonna take us a little while to, to get there. Thank you. We have another question in the chat. It's uh, this doesn't uh, apply directly to home, and uh, they missed the other talks. But how do you deal with tan oaks specifically? Uh, you cut them, uh, and they re-sprout. They tend to break under wind or snow, adding additional fuel ladders. They are important to wildlife, so we tend to be in a quandary. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a hard one. I mean, there's so much. We live in a community, in a landscape with so many sprouting species. This, um, I mean, the drone does the same thing. Redwood does the same thing. Um, it depends on what tools in your toolbox. Uh, smothering sometimes works. Uh, vigilance works. Uh, it depends how much energy you have, how many trees you're talking about. Um, there, uh, from an integrated pest management perspective, uh, there is the tool of a 
herbicide application to the cut stump applied in a very limited and specific and targeted time, very low chemical, um, but you know, that's not in everyone's tool. Uh, the plastic and smothering, um, I've seen work in some instances, not all instances. There's the stump grinding, it depends on where the tree is, um, but it's, it's difficult. I, I, won't, I will fully acknowledge that challenge. So another question came in. We have some blackberry thickets that give some added building security. What are your recommendations about that? I mean, blackberry doesn't burn in all conditions. Um, the problem that we face is that when we're under condition to burn, so the rest of the state. And so we get into this coup avail availability issue, um, which may mean those blackberries are in a much more receptive condition. Um, you know, from a maintenance perspective, I would try and get those blackberries out of there. Um, goats, uh, digging um, are some of the other strategies. But yeah, I mean, the point is that if, it's, if you've got some more space around the building, it's easier to maintain the building in and of itself. So there's some added benefit to, to pushing that vegetation back a little bit further so that you can work on all sides of it. Great. So any other questions out there? We, uh, we've got Yana here. So uh, if there's more that came up in the talk, we'd love to know. Uh, people can turn on their video and, uh, and also their uh, mic if they want to ask a direct question. Otherwise, we'd encourage folks to put some more questions in the chat. Um, I wonder about firewood. I mean, obviously, a lot of people have firewood around their homes. Um, so that's something you recommend that people keep at least 30 feet away from the structure, I assume? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's an interesting challenge because in the winter, it's sort of less of an issue, right? And in the summer, it's a great issue. For me and my cabin management, um, I will leave my firewood on my front porch in the winter. And then when I know I'm going to be uh, not there very frequently and it's drying out. Well, that firewood, um, you know, I only keep a small amount just for, you know, every couple day use. Um, I take that off. I mean, I really, I really change what's on my decks and I think about what's around my buildings um, during that drier time period. Um, it's a, you know, the question is really what are you going to regret and um, and how do we manage what we have and. Uh, you know, no one wants to go out in a, in a terrible rainstorm to go get their firewood, but yet at the same time, maybe we don't leave it there all year. Maybe we don't store a cord and a half on the front porch. Um, <laughs> you know, working through that is, is I think, the, the thing we need to be thinking about and, and thinking about the seasonality of it. Mm -hmm. And I saw in some of the photos that uh, you have pea gravel and things like that around some of these houses. I'm wondering about flammability of just bare soil and if you recommend kind of a pea gravel uh, you know, thing around the house or concrete or if uh, simply bare soil is. Um, yeah, I mean, those are, those are all real issues. I mean, it rains a lot here. We've got a lot of grass, we've got a lot of vegetation growth. It takes a lot to to manage that and can you get a weed barrier and then something non-flammable on top of that. Um, not every scenario has been tested. It really depends on what, what is adjacent to the building, whether it's a perimeter foundation, whether it's post and tier, whether the siding comes down low, you know, what the particular situation is. I would say if you the best you can do is set it up so the maintenance is easy. Um, and manageable. Um, my cabin's on post and tier. That's not ideal. Um, I have to do a lot of pulling stuff out from underneath my cabin to, to try and manage the light that you know, intrudes underneath. Uh, but I'm also afraid to put some kind of um, mesh because then I might not be able to manage that vegetation. So it's a little easier for me to get access to it year round. Uh, I finally stopped the habit of storing my, you know, my extra building materials and other things out from underneath the house. It's so tempting. Um, I think you have to figure out the system that works for you. Um, I, my cabin's in the grass. There's a lot of harding grass. It seeds everywhere. Pea gravel would be a nightmare for me because it, the harding grass will root right through it. Um, I weed whack really heavily and I, and I, um, work hard to you know get something that's pretty short so even if i do get flame contact it's not going to have much you know 
hike uh, on those flames and so it won't ignite anything. Um, managing under the deck is particularly challenging. Um, I've been using some, this is you know funky and low tech, but I had some old um, sheet metal uh, from, from roofing and I've been laying some panels down underneath the deck. Um, the brown, they kind of blend in a little bit. And now I don't have as much grass growth, so I can really I can manage it a little easier. So figuring out a system that works for you is what it's about. Whether it's you and a weed whacker, whether it's a weed barrier, whether you know it's a you know a, a physical barrier so you don't get the light penetration, um, those are all good. But when you seal things up, like under a deck, um, you still need air movement because uh, otherwise you can get rot in that, in that deck structure. If you seal it up but don't allow air exchange some additional challenges. So we're constantly battling the rain and the moisture and the moisture management as well as the vegetation growth. Um, they're all real, real challenges. Great, well, seeing no more questions in the chat. I have a question. Oh, great. Um, does your institute work at all with the insurance companies? You know, we've been in a really horrible situation where most people have lost or can are paying a lot of money for fire insurance. and You'd think that if people are taking some of the steps that you're recommending that the fire or the insurance companies, I know they, they tend to blanket a zip code and say everyone in this zip code is now at high risk and they're all going to pay, either not get insurance or pay a huge amount. It'd be nice if we could demonstrate to them that we're taking fire precautions and be able to at least insure or, or have some kind of dialogue about that. Yeah. I hear you, Jimmy, and these are complex issues. And um, yeah, I, I I have some some interaction with the insurance space, and it's probably a a forty minute conversation that we need to have about where we're going. I have some optimism that things are changing, and the insurance market is really complicated in how it's managed in California, in part through a citizen initiative from the eighties. Um, that makes it difficult to manage risk in some ways. Um, and yet, you know, trying to deal with it from a, I mean, the point is, I'm just gonna say, and I'm not a defender of the insurance companies, but we do need insurance because if we don't have insurance, we can't sell. We can't sell our properties and suddenly our value, our properties have no value. Um, so trying to figure out a way to structure the market, incentivize, larger companies to stay in California, bring in some new companies, it, it's highly complicated. And I'm optimistic that we're making some headway in that space and the insurance companies are getting a better handle on evaluating risk and rewarding those people for the kinds of work that we're talking about. Um, the biggest challenge is how do they do that in a way where they don't have to send somebody out to every property? because the expense of doing that is greater than often the value of the insurance policy itself. Um, maybe that's a little wonky and nerdy to talk about, but it, there's, there, is a lot of, there are a lot of good folks working in this space and I'm, I'm feeling more optimistic about what we're gonna get. That was a great question. Anybody else out there have questions they wanna chime in in real voice or add to the chat? It looks like uh, we've got some, we're looking at Firewise, uh, or Garber Village may help with insurance, also Matol, Shelter Co, Bendo, et cetera. Yeah. Garberville, so that's good news. Yeah, and, and Firewise might be the vehicle. It might be somewhere else. I mean, it's these are dynamic systems. Um, you know, in Santa Rosa, there were a number of Firewise communities that burned, um, but that was the, you know, the top Firewise thing was 2017. That's five years ago from now. I mean, our evolution in thinking has, has sort of had a quantum leap um, since 2017, especially in this understanding what defensible space means adjacent to buildings. So, um, you know, I think it's all about becoming more uh, aware and fluent in this space with what the risks are and managing those risks better. But I, I totally um, support communities working together and I'm really inspired by what communities can do. And I mean, you know, Will Harling's message I think is really powerful around what communities can do together. And this is kind of the same sort of stuff um, it's just applying it at a more fine scale at, you know, the, the immediate privilege and space we live in. All right. Well, seeing no other questions, unless anybody else wants to chime in, I think we're at the point where uh, we're ready to say goodnight. So um, I am going to 
thank Iana Valakovic on behalf of Friends of the Lost Coast and the BLM King Range National Conservation Area. Uh, we'd like to thank her for this talk. We hope you found her lecture exciting and expire, inspiring, as well as the larger Living with Fire lecture series. Our next virtual lecture series is entitled Marine Life of the Lost Coast, a two-part mini-series that will be on February 22nd from 6 to 7 p.m. with Dr. Paul Bardot and his talk on invertebrates of the Lost Coast. And then on uh, the 1st of March, we've got Dr. Don Goley presenting Marine Mammals of the North Coast, what we are learning about elephant seals, gray whales, and stranded marine mammals. And that will be on Tuesday, March 1st from 6 to 7 p.m. So visit lostcoast.org for more information and Zoom links for each lecture. And thanks again for tuning in tonight and to learn more about Friends of the Lost Coast or to make a donation to support our work, including programs like this lecture series, please visit our website. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thanks again to Yana Volokovic and uh, the UC Cooperative Extension for sponsoring this talk and also to the Friends of the Lost Coast. So enjoy the rest of your evening and all the best. Thanks again, Yana. Thank you, everybody. It's great to see everyone. I'm going to shut that. How do I shut that um, recording off? I'll do it. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Thanks a lot. That was fun. <laughs>